George and Barbara <coughs> Kelly for their continuing support of the Emily Dickinson Lectureship. with us who sponsor our Mary Rolling Reading Series, which continues through the whole year. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks go to the uh, Joseph L. Gruchy Poetry Endowment, the Africana Research Center, the Department of African American Studies, the Institute for Arts and Humanities, the Paterno Fellows Program, the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, the University Libraries, and the College of the Liberal Arts. Of course, thanks to Marilyn Nelson for coming to Penn State for this visit. Uh, we'll have time for questions after Marilyn's reading as well as a book sale and signing. And so before we begin, I'd just like to ask everybody to please make sure and turn off your cell phones. Thanks a lot. And um, once Julia turns off her cell phone, I will be able to uh, uh, turn the podium over to Penn State English professor and poet Julia Spiker Kasdorf, who will introduce Marilyn Nelson. Um, and um, I want to just add my thanks, I think you can never have too much thanks, to Chick and John and Emily Rowling, who came all the way from Montana, just for poetry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also for supporting this series, because um, not only do we hold these events, but the people we bring in actually affect our curriculum choices through all year long, and so that's a, a very valuable contribution. And also to George and Barbara Kelly. Um, Barbara fell in love with Emily Dickinson on this campus a long time ago, and because of that, we have this very special uh, poetry reading every year. So, all the way from California. Thank you. I want to say that it's no secret that the Emily Dickinson lecture, the most glittery poetry reading of the year, is always scheduled with an eye on the football calendar. <laughs> I mention this because long before I met Marilyn Nelson, my most distinct association with her poetry had to do with Damone Jones. Some of you may recall him as number 76, a very talented offensive lineman from Philadelphia with NFL promise until he injured, injured his knee, then his back. He won the Ridge Riley Award for Sportsmanship, Scholarship, Leadership, and Friendship at the end of the famously terrible football season of 2003. It was Joe Paterno's worst season, with only three wins, depending on which archive you pay attention to. <laughs> that was Damone's senior year. But what I recall of that fall is Damone, twice a week, painfully curling his 310-pound, 6-foot, 5-inch body into the tiny desks with fixed armrests in the Sackett building excruciating to watch his pain. Yet, he would never accept my offer to sit at the big desk up front. He wrote some fine poems that semester, and when it came time to recite the published one he'd chosen to memorize, he stood up and delivered Marilyn Nelson's extraordinary sonnet, Balance. In only 14 lines in that poem, Nelson renders a complicated psychological situation. A young, beautiful house slave, mindful of a white man's desirous attention, is described and analyzed by another envious slave. That happened more than a decade ago, but I can still feel the hush that fell in the classroom. Reciting that poem in about three minutes, Damone transcended time, place, culture, 
gender, and even physical stature. Nelson's evocative and beautiful poem drew all of us into a house in Kentucky in the 1860s and in, into the powerful play of one young woman's balancing act. This is the genius of Marilyn Nelson. Through story and plain spoken language, through resonant <coughs> details and authentic voices, all products of her keen craft, her poems create temporary communities of understanding and sympathy. It happens that that beautiful young slave was Nelson's mythic great-great-grandmother. And so the poem was spun from family tradition and memory, but also archival research, public history, and imagination. And she uses those approaches, and has used them many times since, to write many other stories. I admire the discipline of this work, always compelled by curiosity, sustained by research, and wildly generous in its range of voice and topic. Daughter and granddaughter of school teachers, Nelson has taught for 24 years at the University of Connecticut, most recently. She's published more than 24 books, among them translations from the Danish. And her work has been recognized three times a National Book Award finalist, twice for collections of poetry, and, and also for Carver, A Life, which is a biography of George Washington Carver in verse for younger readers. She's received the Poets Prize, the Robert Frost Medal, which is the Poetry Society of America's most prestigious award for distinguished lifetime achievement in poetry. She served as the Poet Laureate of Connecticut for five years and was recently elected a Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. A Wreath for Emmett Till, a book for young adults written as a heroic crown of Petrarchan sonnets. Now, if you wonder what that is, you'll have to ask someone. <laughs> Maybe she'll tell us. Um, that book, an unlikely form married with a surprising topic, won the 2005 Boston Globe Horn Book Award and was designated a 2006 Coretta Scott King Honor Book, a 2006 Michael L. Prince Honor Book, and a 2006 Lee Bennett Hopkins Poetry Award Honor Book. And I mention that because that award is an national award that's given by this library every year and actually they gave one of those awards earlier today. So, this is not the first time Marilyn Nelson has been here. Her latest book, another collection of sonnets for young readers, is How I Discovered Poetry. I consider it a great honor and pleasure to have such a distinguished poet return and read for us here at Penn State. And I invite you to welcome Marilyn Nelson. generous introduction, Julia, and um, let me thank the Kellys and the Rollings and the English department and everybody else on campus. Thank all of you for coming out this evening. We could have been doing something a lot more fun, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I have to sort through some uh, Xerox copies. No, I will start from the book. I uh, thought I would start with a couple of uh, short poems. I seem to write sonnets a lot. It seems to be my go-to form if I don't have another one. So I, I read um, two sonnets to start with. This uh, is called First Alzheimer's Sonnet. It's, 
about fearing that disease. A wave enters the membrane labyrinth and something mushrooms from nothing to now. Unacted on, thought disappears from sense like the vapor trail of a skeptic's awe. Look up, no trace remains. The road to hell is paved with good intentions once conceived of, twice forgotten in a millisecond, micromillisecond, cumulus lost on a breeze. So what if for a moment the flame burns higher as a thought forms of you, my dear, then psses back into oblivion? Each cloud is one face of the atmosphere, as each wave is one aspect of the sea. Forget you? Never. Not while I am me. Uh, and this is called Second Alzheimer's Sonnet. And um, they're both poems playing with the idea of forgetfulness. And this one I have to say a little extra note. I've been writing poems, some poems in which the muse appears, and we have little discussions, and the muse appears in this one. And you'll recognize the voice. Second Alzheimer's Sonnet. How many things will I forget today? How many times stop still and ask myself what I was going to do? In what new ways will my mind play tricks on me? What a wealth of experiences tossed into the wind. What masterpieces lost even to me? Without them, am I still one of a kind? A unique loop of interpreted memory? How much can one forget an actor's name, the novel I finished reading last night, where the damn car keys are, and still remain a bubble of identity riding a wave of light? A turd in sewage remembers a meal, my muse remarks. I am what makes you real. <laughs> My muse is kind of irreverent, <laughs> kind of difficult to deal with. Uh, oh, actually, I had another muse poem to read. Uh, this is called Little Dialogue with the Muse. Out of its context, does the self exist? Or are we merely products of our time, history, culture, born to pantomime stock roles as minor members of the cast of someone else's drama? Are we dressed in uniqueness, or are we all the same, each of us tricked out in a meaningless name? Once we're erased, how long will we be missed? How long remembered? Now is the muse. You resemble clouds drifting across the pl pale blue atmosphere. Does what we've done survive in a half-life of infinite decrease, perfect or flawed? Your work writes on the wind, Kilroy was here, the signature of a November leaf. Uh, now I read something a little bit bigger. Maybe I'll read this. Um, I have a f friend, now it doesn't matter, does it? This is a poem about visiting a friend of mine who is a Roman Catholic priest on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. So you have to imagine 
the scene here in a Catholic church, um, early mass, Sunday morning, the church is on the beach, the windows are open, you can hear the waves, the sound of the waves, and little birds are flying in and out of the open windows and fluttering up around the ceiling and singing. And maybe that's all you need to know. Uh, um, my, the speaker here is me, who is called Ama Mama in this poem, because I call my friend Abba Yaakov. Abba means father. Uh, so my friend is Abba Yaakov, and I am Ama Mama, and this is Corpus Christi Sunday, the celebration of the body of Christ. Sounds very religious, doesn't it? We'll see whether it is. <laughs> Songbirds skitter among the rafters, scissoring in and out of the high-stained windows. Abiyaka watches them a moment, fingering through his tousled hair. He looks at the gathered waiting, cocks his head, smiles. Today is the feast day of the mewling newborn in the hay, the thirsty teacher wiping his brow, the dying man's iron grimace. Today we celebrate a squalling toddler with a load in his pants, a runny-nosed five-year-old, a boy with scabbed <coughs> knees. We celebrate Jesus who suffered and died, who laughed, who sneezed, who scratched where he itched. He did not live by bread alone, but he lived by bread. And he liked a cool drink of fresh dipped water drawn smiling from the well. He tasted, he saw. When he stepped out onto a wave, his feet got muddy. He faced forward as we do with fingers crossed faith. Six rows from the door, Ama Mama notices the island echolessness of the morning's songbirds. She'd never dreamed, though she'd always somehow known, she'd be here again watching him space gaze as he speaks, hearing him laugh. He described last night's dinner wine as masculine, explained that its taste was what every man would like to be, intelligent, handsome, reliable, and a little bit rough around the edges. His voice, she thinks, is almost sweeter than the bird song. As his body, the church, we remember ourselves in our Eucharist, giving thanks for the assurance that we shall not end here. Trekking through the desert of brevity toward this shimmering Zion, is it bread we eat or manna? Wine we drink or dew. We make Eucharist for the daily miracles which sustain us, for food, drink, and fellowship, for the promise of Christ. The pause fills with Twitter, beyond faint surf, vast silence. Abba Yaakov raises his eyebrows, shrugs. If we are the body of Christ, then our bodies are Christ's bodies too, no? Your bodies, mine. A thousand years ago, exiled for his writings, St. Simeon continued to describe indwelling light. If we truly love Christ, he wrote, we inhabit Christ, every part of us, even the most secret, the parts we hide in shame, every part becomes his and is therefore healed, hallowed, beautiful, and radiant with loving light. When this happens, everything we see, we see gently. Every word we speak listens. 
Every act is reverent. Every caress is a blessing. Around Ama Mama, backs straighten, heads slowly nod. His dark lit eyes beacon the pews. Those of you who have partners, who have vowed a love without ceasing, when you lie together, make love to the immeasurable mystery of spirit in flesh. Touch each other with Christ's touch. Kiss each other with Christ's mouth. Give to and receive from each other Christ's body. Your fingers a sacrament of tenderness. Blessing air pocked with gasps, Abba Yaakov says, Amen. <laughs> um, I heard this sermon and gasps from the audience. He's talking about sex. <laughs> I read uh, uh, a little bit from a larger piece. It's, uh, the book it's from is called The Cachoeira Tales. It's about a trip to... Uh, Brazil to northern Brazil, and uh, why was it? I was going to read this. I don't remember. Um, it's about a trip to northern Brazil, mostly in um, Salvador de Bahia, but uh, also to a village called Cachoeira. Uh, what I'm reading is about. I went with my family. I had a grant. I had a Guggenheim. Grant, which I used to take my sister and brother on this trip to Brazil. And two other friends went with us. They are in this. I, it's an, the, the poem itself is an imitation of the Canterbury Tales. So it's written in rhyme couplets. And it's about a pilgrimage, and I like the Canterbury Tales. And as the Canterbury Tales, the people don't have names, they're called by their occupation. So uh, one of them is a jazz musician, that's my brother. Um, one of them is a theater director, that's my sister. And then there was an airplane pilot with us and a social worker. And while we were on this trip, we met a couple of African American women who were traveling around the world. And we had the feeling that they might have been CIA agents or something because they seem very mysterious but funny at the same time. So I'm going to read a little bit in which we are in Salvador de Bahia and we encounter these two CIA agents maybe? I don't know what they were. Their names are Harmonia and Maureen. And I don't think I need to say anything else about them. It starts, it's, and again, it's the, the poem is a book-length poem. So it starts in the middle of things. Uh, this section is called Harmonia and Maureen. A man's eyes, when a young Bayana walks, saunters, parades, or better, undulates. When a young Bayana undulates past him, back straight, up tilting, with sun-gilded limbs and a butt like twin scoops of dolce de leche ice cream. A man's eyes light up. He snorts puffs of steam. The old Bayanas in white eyelet shirts, the saints' bright beads and long white eyelet skirts sit by bubbling cauldrons in acarage stands scooping shrimp into fritters. With a glance, men dismiss them. They take a bite and pay. The old Bayanas watch them walk away. We heard them first, then met two sisters from home, Harmonia and her sidekick, Maureen. They were retracing the diaspora. They'd just finished doing West Africa, 
Jamaica and Haiti were coming next. Were they wealthy? Or was this the pretext of two very deep undercover spies? <laughs> it might have been a James Bondian disguise. Just think of the movie possibility. Two sisters keeping it safe to be free. They wore outfits bought on the continent. Harmonia, a turquoise and green print with matching head wrap. Maureen, black and red with lots of cowries clinking in her dreads. You know black people have always been wanderers, but God made us too poor, too poor to pay the fare, Maureen said in some kind of secret code she acted like we were supposed to know. <laughs> Harmonia cried, yes, girl, that's the truth. She poked me with one elbow. Ain't it the truth? <laughs> Maureen went on. Negro got put out of line for first day gifts at the beginning of time because he was looking at white woman funny. That's why black folks don't have no money, but we all over the globe. Say amen. Black folk arrived on the American part of this planet like seeds riding birds. Honey, frankly, I wouldn't give two turds for that piece of de desert they're fighting about over there. Somebody need to teach their ass to share. <laughs> Maureen high-fived Harmonia's lifted hand. Seemed like they need another promised land. Seemed like some bearded white man with a hat could prove that if you carefully retranslate one letter of scripture, you can see God say the promised land someplace in Uruguay. <laughs> Harmonia threw up her hands and screamed. Then she did a little dance around Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe politically incorrect, but <laughs> they were very entertaining. <laughs> I read from something serious, more serious now. Um, several years ago, when I was a uh, poet laureate of Connecticut, I got a phone call from uh, the director of the History Museum in Waterbury, Connecticut, asking me whether I would be willing to write some poems honoring what she called a set of human remains in the museum's collection. Set of human remains was a phrase I had never heard before. Uh, it turns out that this museum owns a skeleton. That's what a set of human remains is. <laughs> and they have owned this skeleton. At that point, they had owned the skeleton for about 60 years. And they knew nothing about whose bones these were. But shortly before they came to me, they had hired a team of forensic scientists and historians to do research into this set of human remains, and this team had discovered that this set of human remains, which had the name Larry written across <laughs> its forehead in indelible ink, Larry, um, was the skeleton of a man named Fortune who was enslaved in Waterbury, Connecticut, in the early to mid 18th century. So this is before the Revolutionary War. Fortune and his wife Dinah, they found his wife Dinah. They had four children. The firstborn was named Africa. They were owned by a doctor, a bone setter, whose name was Preserved Porter. And sometime when Fortune was in his 40s, he died apparently as a result of a fall, um, which they guess because um, his neck was broken and it was the kind of break that you get from falling from a high place. They don't believe he was murdered. When Fortune died, Dr. Porter took his body to a secret place outside of Waterbury and performed a dissection. At this point, human dissection was illegal all over the Western world. So he had to do this in secret because he was breaking the law. <coughs> um, then Dr. Porter 
strip the flesh from fortune's <coughs> bones, drilled holes in the long bones, boiled all of them to free them of flesh and marrow, numbered them carefully, and reassembled the skeleton, and hung it in a room in his home to be used as a medical school. So, as far as we know, this could have been the first homegrown medical school in North America. Meanwhile, Dinah and the four children of Fortune and Dinah were still enslaved in the Porter home. So they had to live with the fact that their husband and father was hanging in this room. The, the skeleton passed on through many generations of the Porter family. Every generation of the Porter family produced at least one doctor. It was finally presented to this museum by the first woman to graduate medical school at Johns Hopkins University. She was a Porter. She gave the skeleton to uh, the museum. She remembered playing with the skeleton on rainy days. They would take a leg bone and hit the skull around the attic floor. I'm going to read three. It's been, I was asked to write this because the museum and the local symphony orchestra had agreed that if they got somebody to write words, they would, the orchestra would commission a composer to set them to music. So this has been turned into an oratorio with music composed by Dr. Isaya Barnwell, who was one of the original singers in this group, Sweet Honey in the Rock. If you know Sweet Honey, you know. If you don't, it doesn't mean anything. But uh, it's wonderful, really a wonderful, powerful piece. Um, I'm going to read three of the pieces. These are solos for three different um, voices. The first one is called Dinah's Lament. Miss Lydia doesn't clean the doctor room. She says she can't go in that room. She's scared. She make me take the dust rag and the broom and clean around my husband hanging there. Since she's seen Fortune Head in that big pot, Miss Lydia say that room make her feel ill, sick with the thought of boiling human broth. I wonder how she think it make me feel. To dust the hands what used to stroke my breast, to dust the arms what hold me when I cried. To dust where his soft lips were and his chest what curved its warm against my back at night. Through every season, sun up to star light, I heft scrub need one black woman alone except for my children. The world so white, nobody know my pain but fortune bones. This is the solo for the Dr. Preserved Border. For 50 years, my feeling hands have practiced the bone setter's healing touch, a gift inherited by Porter men. I have manipulated joints, cracked necks, and set my neighbors back to work. I've bled and purged fever and flux, inoculated for smallpox, prescribed fresh air and vegetables, cod liver oil and laudanum, and closed the lightless eyes of the new dead. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Herewith begins my dissection of the former body of my former slave, which served him who served me throughout his life, and now serves the advance of science. Note well how death softens the human skin, making it almost transparent, so that under my reverent knife, the first cut takes my breath away. It feels like cutting the whole world. 
it falls open like bridal gossamer. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Standing on a new continent beyond the boundaries of nakedness, I am forever changed by what I see. The complex, delicate organs fitted perfectly in their shelter of bones, the striated and smooth muscles, the beautiful integuments, the genius strokes of thumb and knee. In profound and awful intimacy, I enter fortune, and he enters me. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. And um, this is Fortune's piece. It's called Not My Bones. I was not this body. I was not these bones. This skeleton was just my temporary home. <coughs> Elementary molecules converged for a breath, then danced on beyond my individual death. But I am not my body. I am not my body. We are brief incarnations. We are clouds in clothes. We are water respirators. We are how earth knows. I bore light passed on from an original flame. While it was in my hands, it was called by my name. But I am not my body. I am not my body. You can own a man's body, but you can't own his mind. That's like making a bridle to ride on the wind. I will tell you one thing, and I'll tell you true. Life's the best thing that can happen to you. But you are not your body. You are not your body. You can own someone's body, but the soul runs free. It roams the night sky's mute geometry. You can murder hope. You can pound faith flat, but like weeds and wildflowers, they grow right back. For you are not your body. You are not your body. You are not your body. You are not your bones. What's essential about you is what can't be owned. What's essential in you is your longing to raise your itty bitty voice in the cosmic praise. For you are not your body. You are not your body. Well, I woke up this morning just so glad to be free, glad to be free, glad to be free. I woke up this morning in restful peace. For I am not my body. I am not my bones. I am not my body. Glory, hallelujah. I am not my bones. I am not my bones. mind reading two more poems. Um, this is uh, <coughs> actually the there are several voices in this in this poem, but it's also a, 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 it, it's a slice of life except that the muse speaks in this poem. Let's get that's also a slice of life. Maybe when the, I'll do something so you can hear. There's me, there's a taxi driver, and there's the muse. And I think maybe it doesn't need more than that. It's kind of a long poem, but it's a narrative. So I think you should be able to stay with me in this narrative. It's called Faster Than Light. I'm trying to think of whether I can give you any other background information, but I think it's all here. I didn't want to pay to park my car, so I took a taxi to the train station. New London is an hour's drive away, but it was the best solution I could find. After ten miles or so of idle chat in which my occupation was confessed, the driver said he was a physicist. As a hobby, he said. Driving was his trade. 
Still tr struggling to connect my seatbelt clasp, I asked his opinion of an article I'd skimmed last weekend in the New York Times about a man who researches time travel. He made that Parisian cabbies make in early August when Americans tried to parlay avec them at rush hour. <laughs> he gave me a long over-the-shoulder glare, squeezed the steering wheel, and hit the gas. He said, he's wrong. The one thing that would work is to fly faster than the speed of light through a wormhole. The gravitational field is full of holes. You only have to find one and be pulled by metagravitational force. For energy, you could use compressed song, or words to that effect. My memory isn't what it was ten minutes ago. He drove with ten white knuckles on the wheel, his pinched blue right eye looking back at me as we took the curves on two screaming tires. Faster than light travel, that's the secret. The government's been onto this for years. There are other planets waiting to be explored. This one's almost used up. It's time to move. We won't take people who don't measure up, our intellectual inferiors. Let them inherit the earth. We'll take the skies. I still couldn't figure out the seatbelt catch. <laughs> the poor and ignorant population grows so quickly. What? Deny the right to life? There is a fucking holocaust of the unborn. But some races and cultures lack the gift of scientific knowledge. It's the dross of their stupidity which weighs us down and holds us back. Faster than light travel! Faster than light travel! The only way! We hurtled down the turnpike, passing trucks faster than light, and cars full of people driving hell-bent to get to work on time. Faster than light travel! That's a ticket! Finally, we pulled up at the train station. I'd given up on fastening my seatbelt. Stupid contraption. Trusting to the universe to grant me more good luck. I scrambled out. We wished each other well. My tip was generous, if I do say so myself. Faster than light, he yelled, late for his next pickup, zooming off, talking to his phone. My cup brimmed over with Psalm 23. Buoyancy's sometimes stronger than gravity. I wheeled my luggage down the crowded train, then found a seat and opened my magazine. Some influence is affecting a space probe, I read, which baffles scientists. It will rewrite the laws of physics and astronomy when scientists understand and name that force. The plan was for Pioneer 10 to arrive some million years from now at some far place. In case of alien contact, there's a plaque of a human couple and a celestial map showing Earth with a spear held to her head. Thirty years beyond its launch, it's past Pluto, the farthest planet orbiting our sun, in empty space seven billion miles from Earth. The article said current theories can't explain what's causing the decrease in Pioneer's speed, it's almost imperceptible, a mere six miles per hour per century. But Pioneer 10 is pe being pulled back to the sun. I closed my eyes several million years from now, as if a species on the brink of extinguishing itself said to a future species, remember me, the species which perfected genocide? Will science ever discover humility? Now is the muse. Right, fool. You want to say on guard to science? Why stop there? Why don't you attack knowledge while you're at it? And how about progress? Ain't that a bit ambitious, Miss William Blake? <laughs> what was that voice? Listen, Marilyn, listen, as saints once listened, and of course the mad. I looked around. The other passengers were busy with laptops, breakfasts, books. And where does it get off accusing me? Ambition? Why, I've surpassed every fantasy I had. Would I presume to badmouth our attempt to cheat death? My poems, a handful of dust trying to get back to supernova, like every longing. Everything alive. 
but ambition wants the immortality of a members only country club Valhalla, an eternal summit meeting of great names. Millions of light years into the future, that immortality ambition breeds with serendipity. What will it mean? Our poetry, our books, our language, dust of words never again to be spoken. I wonder what will last millions of years? A stone? A nuclear waste storage site? Will Homo sapiens evolve or die? Will wiser beings populate our Earth? We're dying faster than the speed of light, our fame forgettable. Will good deeds, too, vanish like molecules of exhaled breath to be recycled by the universe? Muse. Girl, get on back to the raft. When you try to think, the breeze between your ears nearly blows me away. <laughs> my muse again, so much for my magazine. I closed its pages and began to drift. As if you wasn't drifting all along. If you had the good sense God promised the carrot, you'd know that what lasts is the hush of space, the hiss of orbit, and the hum of stars. If you could launch a space probe, I wondered, would you take up my name engraved in gold, my puny thoughts, my hopes for the future? And if I knew I'd be anonymous, would I publish? Would I write poems at all? During the countdown of the anonymous, you'd be trying to scratch your initials on the hull. <laughs> well, muse of disposable poetry, at least I'm not producing toxic waste. But poets who want immortality, poets who are ambitious, is it wrong to want life after our deaths? for our songs? Leave immortality to cancer cells. They don't know when to stop. Just when they reach the point of no return, the body dies and the cancer is returned to Genesis. Genes are programmed to reproduce and die. And poetry to stick on a synapse, lucky to be a line remembered wrong. Your work projected into the future is pulled back to earth by dark energy, the glue which by, binds the cosmos together. From Stanford, I no longer traveled alone. My seatmate fast talked into his cell phone. I'm going to read one more and that will be it, if that is okay, I think. Are you still with me or are you longing to leave? <laughs> Maybe I'll end with a short poem instead of a long poem. This is another sonnet. I think it's a sonnet. Maybe it's not. Um, Last year, Terence Hayes, who uh, just this year won a MacArthur a Genius Grant, he invented a poetic form which he calls of course, the Golden Shovel. It's called the Golden Shovel because he wrote a sequence of poems, each of which uses um, a phrase from a Gwendolyn Brooks poem, and one of them is the golden shovel, the we real cool, we that. So he uses a line from that poem, but he, he did a series of them using lines from Gwendolyn Brooks. The point of the, of the form, of the exercise, is to choose a line from another poem, and then to write the, the, line, the line from the other poem, those become the end words of your poem. So then you're writing your poem horizontally, so you can read two poems. You read your poem horizontally, and then you read the phrase from the other poet's poem vertically. And it's a lot of fun. It's a great exercise for a workshop. 
Um, this one is, um, is where I'm going to stop. It's called Mechanism. And I used a phrase from Rumi. The Rumi phrase is, the moment when he says no, in his no are a thousand yeses. Like you, I'm still waiting impatiently for the promised breathings of mercy, the moment when the shit of a lifetime gets explained, when I will stand looking humbly at my toes as he, she, it, God, the goddess, plural, says, look, nothing personal. Answers to prayers are always no disturbance of the balanced universe. For although in its creation, each soul, each atom matters, it is his slash her slash its slash our slash my loving and just will that no joy outweigh its equivalent pain anywhere. See, there are reasons, order, truth said, the whole schmears, a painstaking, musical, thousand, thousand faceted, self-activated mechanism of yeses. <laughs> the moment when he says no, in his no, are a thousand yeses. I think this is probably enough poetry. Questions or I'll subject you to more of my <laughs> oh, Yes. Well, I don't want to be time. responsible for less poetry, but <laughs> I do have a question. Um, would you mind telling us how you developed your particular love of the sonnet? Um, uh, yes, I I um, I read of uh, I read someplace that the sonnet came into being in, at a time when. It came into being in Italy at a time when people were trying to do verbally what classic architecture and classic art does, that is to re well, how do I say that? Reproduce the um The golden mean, you know, the Fibonacci sequence, the golden mean, the pro perfect proportions. Mm -hmm. And at, at, the, at the point that the <coughs> Petrarchan sonnet came into existence, it was an attempt to re reproduce the perfect proportions that you see in Greek temples, for example, in leaves, in nature. It's a, it's a natural. It's a natural, naturally occurring mathematical proportion. And I just love the idea of people trying to do that in words. And um, I, my, my um, book, The Wreath for Emmett Till, I tried to do that because I wrote Petrarchan sonnets. And I wrote them in a circle, because of course the circle is the, per is the perfect shape also. I just find things like that interesting, that's all. Besides, I find it easy to write iambic pentameter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so while you do work a lot with uh, tightly versed form, like the sonnet or the villanelle, sometimes you do experiment with free verse. 
Uh, in those instances, does content sort of dictate the form, and you feel compelled to write in free verse as opposed to tightly versed form? Um, I mostly write in tight forms. I started when I was first starting to write, I wrote in free verse because nobody was writing in form, and if you went to a teacher and asked to be taught form, they looked at you funny. <coughs> because it was considered so conservative and old-fashioned. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So most of the poems I've written in free verse are old, I think. I've written uh, a couple of things for children, which I think of as broken prose. I don't even think of them as poetry, really. For me, poetry is shaped. And um, <coughs> the, the kind of shape that you can impose with meter and rhyme is so unmistakably there, it's hard to ignore it. And I have a hard time finding shape in free verse. There are some many free verse poems I love, but they're lacking that aspect for me. So, uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Yes? Uh, when you write in dramatic monologue, how much, do you, how much information do you have to know to be able to be that person and write as that person? As much as possible, I guess. <laughs> I heard a radio interview several years ago when Jonathan Franzen won the National Book Award for whatever his novel was that won the National Book Award. Um, and the, the interviewer asked him something about his genius, and he said um, he didn't feel he was a genius at anything but empathy. He could empathize his way into the lives of his characters. And I think, in, in my experience, I do, I write a lot of persona poems, and uh, my experience is that once you've got the information that you need to con convey, the next step is having the empathy to imagine a character. And when you can really feel the character, the voice just kind of happens. The voice is there, but you have to, you have to see the character. I did a... Um, it's not published as a book yet, but some of the poems are in um, uh, fa this book called Faster Than Light. Uh, it's a sequence of poems about an 18th century village in Manhattan. It was called Seneca Village. And I, uh, an editor asked me to write about the village, and I read what, what's known about the village, not too much. Um, but there are census records, and there you have names and ages and occupations. And I used, I created a kind of puppets to explore the history of New York, Manhattan, and of uh, the United States of the period. So these are, I mean, I just kind of invented stories for them to tell and invented characters. So for example, one of the one of the characters is the the village hairdresser and she's a gossip. And um, she's the one who tells about um, I'm sorry, my mind sometimes hits these speed bumps. <laughs> She's the one who tells them about things that are happening in, in uh, national and local history. She's the, re the resource that, of news. And I just invented her, but I feel after a while, I wanted to write more about her because I, I like her as a character. She has opinions, opinions which I don't agree with even. Um, but she turned out to be a pretty strong character. I, I, I used to wonder when I heard novelists talk about how characters didn't want to do this, the character didn't want to do that. I, under, I understand that. You understand that when you're doing persona poems. Sometimes characters have a stronger will than you do. 
and they refuse to to do your bidding.